bringing sports entertainment and technology podcasts together. This is SPNT. You're listening to the Who Day Weekly Podcast. Who Day Weekly is brought to you by Stitcher.com. Download the Stitcher Smart Radio app today at Stitcher.com slash SPNT. What's happening, Bengals fans? Soup's here for Who Day Weekly, episode number 85. That's right, we made it to 85. We've got, um, obviously, a lot of folks are tuned in this week because of our giveaway, our ticket giveaway. We'll get into that and a whole bunch more here on the podcast. Uh, Bengals lose to the Browns over the weekend. Not the effort that we were expecting in the Queen City, but, uh, you know, just it just capped off what was pretty much a terrible week in Cincinnati sports history. Let's uh, let's turn the page, though, and look forward to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like I said, it's episode 85, and uh, welcoming in uh, my co-host, my tag team partner, Mickey Menser. What's happening, Mickey? Not much, man. How are you doing? Uh, you and I recovered from the terrible Game 5 loss that the Reds had on Thursday, and then we had to watch that crap that was Bengals football on Sunday. Man, if we, can we just rewind Sunday to Sunday, the, the, the Cincinnati professional sports, because it was not exciting. No, not exciting. And But the cool thing is with the, with the NFL, there's parity, and we could turn the page, and we can look, we can look ahead because there, there is the potential for the season to get better. Um, and we're, we're a glass-half-full kind of group here, so, so why not? Uh, and at, Normally we have Tim Bates here with us on the program, but uh, we have a newcomer to the podcast his name is Kurt, all the way down in Asheville, North Carolina. Kurt, what's happening, buddy? How's it going, guys? Kurt is uh, one of the writers on WhoDayFans.com. You also know him as Donnie Redboy in the chat room. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. That's my only tip. All right, I'll try not to be. Kurt, uh, Kurt married into a Cleveland Browns family, so you can imagine the amount of fun that he had on Sunday. So we'll talk about that and a whole bunch more here on the podcast. Don't forget, you can email us at podcast at whodayfans.com. You can also give us a follow on Twitter. We are at Who Day Weekly. We'll give away the tickets to the Oakland Raiders game a little bit later on in the program. But before we do that, we must talk about what happened on Sunday. Um, really, guys, the first half, the Bengals, I, I thought they did okay. Going into halftime with a chance to go up 17-7. to There was a play late in the first half. In fact, it was so late that... It ended the half. Mickey, I'll start with you. When you saw the, the when you saw Andy Dalton running up to the line with seven seconds and doing it so nonchalantly with no sense of urgency, and then you saw the way the half ended, do you think that carried in carried over into the second half at all? No, I don't. <clears throat> and I think that you know it's tough to to get everyone on the same page. You know, on a play like that, I think. You know that you know maybe they could have given it another second. I don't know. I mean that, that was tough. Yeah, I was definitely frustrated. But at that point, you know the Bengals were rolling, and it seemed like this was this was a game that they had in hand. I don't think that carried in the second half. I think what I think what carried in the second half is kind of what carried over from last week, where you know the Bengals thought by showing up they were going to win this game and I'm disappointed that two weeks in a row we we saw that and I think it, it you know top down the coaches you know they're, they're they weren't creative you know we're not we, you know we didn't change anything up our halftime adjustments once again were just miserable and you know not until the end of the game did they actually show they had life so I I I was frustrated more at, at like the, the non-adjustments like you know, oh well we'll just try to win so, yeah, I don't think that play really mattered. You know, at the end of the day, that three points wouldn't have mattered. So that's true. It was just it was just more frustrating seeing the lack of effort, you know, coaching staff through the players. You know, Kurt, Mickey brings up a great point, And it seemed like and, and honestly, I, I, I sat there while watching the game in the third quarter and noticed how much more the Browns seemed to want it. They the the, the amount of effort that they put out compared to what the Bengals were doing. Again, I don't know if – you can't say that the Bengals weren't trying, but it definitely, from a visual standpoint, looked like the Browns just simply wanted the game more. 
I mean, that happens a lot. I mean, I talked about it last week a little bit in one of my blogs, and it's just like when you come up against a winless team, you know, this far into the season, I mean, that's just a recipe for danger, especially when you're making it an AFC game and it's a division game and it's an in-state game. So, I mean, you're, you're flirting with disaster when you come up against this team that you're supposed to win. Like I said, we all penciled in wins, just like for the Dolphins game. And then you come out against a team that really has nothing to lose. I mean, if they keep on losing, what do they get? You know, the first pick of the draft next year. But no one really wants to go through the entire season with no wins. So, I mean, you go up against that kind of team with no wins. It's just, it's dangerous. And it bit us in the butt. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's putting it nicely. Um, there were some interesting comments made by my Marvin Lewis. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see this or not. Uh, it was also posted on our uh, Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash who day fans. And Marvin made mention to the fact that he thought his team lacked a nasty approach. Like they, they lacked that killer mentality, that get angry kind of physical play that you've seen historically on his teams at the Ravens and the Steelers. Mickey, what did you make of that comment? I mean, aren't we kind of seeing the same thing? And don't we kind of want to put, you know, be the team that puts teams away? Like, you don't have to win every game by 100 points. You don't have to, uh, you know, just, you know, go out there and, and dominate teams. But you do have to win, and you have to win the games you're supposed to win. And the Bengals aren't doing that. I understand what he says. Um, you know, it, you, I saw you, you know, during the game talking about on Twitter, kind of the same thing. I just, I mean, he's as frustrated as we are. So, I, I, I mean, I tend, I totally agree. I mean, it's just you can't be nice in football. I mean, <laughs> you, 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 you look at the AFC North, and we have this uh, reputation of being this rough tough you know division i mean i'm a little biased but i think it's the toughest roughest division in the in the entire league and i mean you're exactly right we did we did a couple things right i mean we stopped we stopped trent richardson uh, and now montario hardesty is a completely different story however i mean we completely once again our secondary and our linebackers are just like letting it up like we're giving people cushions that we shouldn't give i mean it's almost like we're like opening up the door and saying, would you like to run by me, please? And it's just, it's incredibly frustrating because you kind of want to have that mentality of just knocking people out and saying, not today. No, I, I agree with you both 100%. At the same, uh, but that's not something you can exactly coach, you know, and I don't know. And, and Mickey, we've talked about this in, in past episodes of the podcast. We, we look at a guy like Ray Maluga, who we've given chances year in and year out. Uh, making tackles 10 yards downfield instead of at the line of scrimmage. And that, that to me, is uh, more of an effort-type play. Um, he's never been that aggressive, tenacious middle linebacker like somebody that maybe we think maybe Vontae's perfect could be. Well, we all know my feelings on perfect. Absolutely. But, you know, you know I, didn't even, I didn't even think of it this way until you just talked about it. And it is something – do you remember when we had um, – you know, Reggie on the podcast. Um, and he was talking about how good, um, man, about Ray Lewis, you know, and Ocho Cinco were when they were playing. And it wasn't because they were just that talented. It was just because they worked that hard every day. And I feel like a guy like Maluga has every single, you know, every single tool in the book to be just this incredible linebacker except for the the head and the heart and and you know without putting those things you know in with the package um you just you just aren't going to play to your potential and you're not going to be that dominant so, i mean i can't stand ray lewis but man some, when everything that guy does on game day puts him into puts him in a position to be the best player on the field and you know yes he's older yes he's lost a step and you know now he's done obviously but it's just it, what he's been able to do is impressive, and it starts with his his desire and his and he has his head in it. And I just think, I just think that's that's incredible. So I, I mean, I, that's what I expected from Maluga. I think at this point we're not going to get it. I don't think you know a, a, a switch is going to flip. You know, we may get some cool plays every now and then, but I feel like that is something that we're seeing from Perfect. So you know, that that that's why I'm kind of making the push, like work him in, you know, kind of phase out the guys that, that aren't trying. And 
I mean, something's got to get, we got to get better. Yeah, you would hope. Um, and you, you bring up a guy like Ray Lewis, Mickey, and here's somebody who, okay, so maybe in the last, what, six or seven years, you could argue that maybe from a defensive standpoint, from a technique standpoint, maybe not the best middle linebacker in the league, but the one thing that you can count on with him each and every week is he's going to bring it 100%, and he's going to be a leader in the locker room. I don't know who – I can't – I can't tell you who the leaders in this locker room are. We we I, we could guess that probably Dalton and, and Andrew Whitworth, but outside of those two and, and maybe Pecco, I don't know who your go-to guy is in the locker room on the defensive side of the football that's going to say, put the team on his back and, and really get this team motivated and, and to want to play because this is the Browns, man. You shouldn't be lo- you shouldn't be losing to the Browns and you shouldn't be losing to the Dolphins. Granted, I know you, that's why they play the games, but – Give me a better effort than this. Come on now. I mean, I agree. Look, look at look at the vets we have, and you know, you hope, you know, you know, we we joked about it all off season about how we were signing every you know former number one corner picked, and you look at a guy like Newman, and you expect him to be this presence on the field. And I I said it during the game that got him. He's he's becoming a liability, and and it's sad that you know someone that you hoped you know, would come in and, and fill a role of, like, man, turn the young guys and, and, you know, be in the right position. And maybe he doesn't have, like, the, the flash that he, you know, had when he came out of college. But, I mean, he's just a liability. He's another guy that I feel like partial effort. And, I mean, that, that crap has to stop. It's just frustrating to watch as a fan. Kurt, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, you know, over the last two weeks, I think that our, you know, our number one – quarterback Andy Dalton has been receiving a lot of flack I mean I'm a huge supporter of Andy I don't think there's any reason to be jumping the ship but I'm I'm looking at his stats over you know the seasons so far and the games that we've lost are the games that they lean on him too much I mean it's I mean he had a fantastic rookie season and his second year is going pretty well as you know as well (laughs) however i mean i'm looking at the baltimore game 37 attempts and then the miami game 43 attempts and cleveland 46 attempts i mean when you lean on a guy to throw the ball around 40 times i mean especially just in his second year granted he's getting much better i mean he's gonna make some mistakes i think that they need to look to him as the leader of this football team as the head captain that he can be probably in years coming after this but you still can't lean on him to do everything and that brings me back to to, he can't abandon the running game. However, what has Ben Jarvis Green Ellis been doing? Nothing. So you have to abandon it and go to something else. So it's a double-edged sword. We need to get a you know something going with the running game and to be able to take some pressure off of Andy so he can do his work but yet not be overworked. No, I you you right you t- took the point right out of my mouth, Kirk, because I was going to say the same exact thing. When you have a guy in Andy Dalton who. Uh, he's not. He doesn't have the arm strength of, of Carson Palmer, but he's accurate and, and can throw, throw, throw the passes he needs to throw. But you cannot be going back 89 times in the last two games against teams like the Dolphins and the Browns. Where is the running game? And I know we're not getting the, the type of runs that they were thinking they would get out of Ben Jarvis Green Ellis. It's not all on him. Now, I, you can argue that maybe a lot of it is but the offensive line's not getting the holes that they need to get. They're not getting the push. They're also not protecting Dalton as well. I've noticed a lot over the last two games, Dalton's feeling that phantom rush, and he's getting happy feet back there, which leads to what? Poor technique and poorly thrown balls. And what happened in the, in, in the second half in Cleveland? He threw that poor ball that was high over A.J. Green's head and it was picked off by Joe Hayden. He also had another pick six. I believe that's the third straight game we've given six points to the uh, opposing team based on on bad plays on our side. Now, the good, nice thing about that stuff, guys, is that that's fixable. And technique is fixable. And, 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 and game planning and play calling is fixable. What I'm still concerned about, and I keep coming back to this point, is the effort. It just seems like they're going through the motions and there's just no – there's no killer instinct with this team. And I don't know if I, – I honestly don't know if they've ever had that under Marvin Lewis. I, would, I think in 05 we kind of had it. Um, and you know what was different about 05? They had Odell Thurman at middle linebacker. Well, they did, but then you want to talk about the killer instinct. It, I mean, we, that's the season we started off hot, you know, picking, picking the ball off all the time. And then it seemed like every time we would, we would you know, create a turnover – we're throwing deep the next play. We're going. We're putting our foot on the throat, and it worked. I mean, we that, that was a very successful season. We were scoring a lot. So, I mean, I we had the killer instinct then, and I don't know. 
I don't know, you know, what what they can do to get that back. Um, I, I don't know who there. I don't know who there would, you know, bring that kind of that fire. You know, I don't know if it's an offensive coordinator. You know, I thought Zimmer was, but it just seems like we're soft this year. So I don't know. But I mean, yeah, I agree that it, that we don't have that sort of feeling when with Marvin mostly. You know, I I hate going back to offense, but you were saying something about, like, our offensive line, the running game. I mean, we all got to remember that we had really high, expectation, high expectations for this offensive line. But you got to remember that the middle three guys are all brand new. I mean, Kevin Zeitler was in his rookie year. I mean, you were supposed to have um, – okay, I can't think of it now, the guy from Carolina. and so but, you know he. Thank you, Wharton. But he got injured, and so now Bowling's stepping in. And then, of course, our, our, our boy Kyle Cook got hurt, so now we got Fane stepping in. So our front three middle guys are brand new. Now, you're, there's supposed to be this amazing line, but, I mean, still, I mean, chemistry doesn't come overnight. I mean, I think the chemistry between Dalton and Green is something that, of a fluke and stuff like that. But, I mean, the running game has got to be more than just Green Ellis. It's got to be the line and the back working together, and I'm just not sure it's there yet, and I don't know when it's going to get there. You know, okay, so, you know, and I guess that's on me, too. I kind of forgot about – you forget about these injuries on the offensive line. They they do amount to a, a, a big loss there. And, I, you know, I when I think of the center position, I, I always thought that Jeff Fain would be a pretty good guy. And he hasn't been terrible, but you're right. Uh, replacing the, the, the three in the middle there probably uh, it gets overlooked quite a bit uh, when, when talking about the running game. I mean, it's just – it's it's difficult. I mean, you could you could say whether we had Cedric Benson back or Green Ellis or if Scott got hurt or it, – it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the only one who seemed productive was Scott, and that's because he was running around the outside where the three guys in the middle weren't. So, I mean, that kind of makes you wonder, like, are the holes even there for him? And when he does find – and then you got to wonder, well, if he does find the hole, what kind of choices is he making? He's not in every down back. When he came from the Patriots, I mean, he wasn't carrying it every time. I mean, he was splitting carries, and now he was supposed to split carries with Scott. That didn't even happen at the beginning of the year. But now that Scott's out, of course he's, like, taking, you know, probably 90% of the snaps. Is he, is he a, an every down back? No, he's not. And so we have to find a solution to that. And I don't know if Pyramid or Leonard is that solution. Well, it's not going to be Leonard anytime soon, I don't think. He's been out, uh, out of practice this week with some bruised ribs. So they're really shorthanded at the running back position right now. Just Pierman and uh, Ben Jarvis Green Ellis. They had John Clay. Remember John Clay? Mickey, you're a big, Ohio, uh, big Ten guy uh, running back out of Wisconsin in this week for a tryout. Um, he's not on the roster, so obviously they didn't think, think enough of him, but yeah, they got to get something figured out because uh, offensively they're kind of in a funk right now. Yeah, they're totally in a funk, and I, you know, I think that I think that you know that lack of creativity comes back into it, and I think you know you kind of create your funk. the The pick six that Dalton threw was something that we telegraphed all day. I don't think the route was there ever, and we just forced it. So, um, I, I. I don't, you know, I they need to make some sort of move at running back. They just don't have enough healthy bodies in case someone gets, you know, injured. But uh, yeah, something's got to change. And I, I think we got to go back to how we started the season, where, you know, we were we were stretching the field, we were we were throwing, you know, different looks out. Um, you know, we, we have somewhat of a wildcat. You know, if if you're struggling that much to run the ball, why not mix that in? Try to change something up. So, um, I I don't know I. I, I want I want to see something different, and I want to see I want I want to feel like the players care as much as the fans do. Right, and that's the biggest thing. And I and I and I've been saying it, uh, I guess now for uh, the last two weeks. You know, you you, you want to see the effort. You want to see them amped up. You want to see them flying to the football. And it just seemed on Sunday that they were going through the motions. Granted, Cleveland probably up a little higher for this game because it's an in-state game, like you said, Kurt. But uh, regardless. Bengals now, uh, you know, they win three games on the road. Or no, that wasn't right. Now nah, that maybe it was. I'm so lost. I'm mixed. I'm mixed up in all my all my sports and shows. It's it's ridiculous. Either way, they were three and one, and now they're looking at three and three with a big game coming up this Sunday night at Paul Brown Stadium against the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll talk about that in just a bit. But before we do that, I just want to remind you that you can rate and review the show on iTunes. We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you get a chance, log on to. 
iTunes and leave us a review. We certainly appreciate it. You can also do that from your podcasts app. If you're an iOS user, if you have an iPhone or an iPod Touch, download the podcasts app and subscribe to our show. That way you can leave a review there as well. We certainly appreciate any feedback, uh, good or bad. Um, the podcast awards. Thank you, everybody who nominated the show uh, over the last couple of weeks. We'll know here, I think, right around October 28th, whether or not uh, Who Day Weekly is a final finalist this year in the sports category. But again, thank you, everybody who who nominated the show, and uh, I certainly appreciate it. And we'll keep you posted. Hopefully, we're finalists again uh, next year. But I think we need to do some housekeeping things, uh, Mickey. What about you? What do you think? Uh, I think we do. I <laughs> for, think we're due. For those of you who are new to the podcast and haven't tuned in over the last, what, six or seven weeks, we've been running an 85 for 85 contest. We were hoping to get Chad Johnson on the show tonight. Of course, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen. Um, but we wanted to give away two tickets to a, a, a fan who tweeted hashtag 85 for 85 over the last couple of weeks. And uh, thank you. Thank you to everybody who submitted those via Twitter. But Last, but our, uh, I guess without further ado, we'll certainly announce this year's winner of 85 for 85 contests. He is Daryl Williams. Congratulations, Daryl. You can follow him on Twitter. He is at Cowdog Design. So congratulations, Daryl. I'll be in touch and uh, let you know about those tickets. But uh, so, yeah, there you go. Thank you again, everybody, for, uh, for submitting your tweets and for bothering chat as much as everybody did it was, it was quite funny to see some of the uh, some of the tweets sent his way so and it looks like daryl's in the chat room as well congratulations daryl uh so there you go mickey we, we made dreams come true tonight that's awesome i, I, I couldn't <laughs> couldn't have picked a better fan i think <laughs> so there you go like i said thanks everybody for for submitting your tweets and uh it's a shame we couldn't get chad on here but that's okay we can still talk about chad what do you think he's up to Probably playing Call of Duty or something. Maybe I don't, I don't know. He's got his hands full. That's for sure. Yeah. I was hoping. I was hoping to get a little ring on the phone, but uh, yeah. I I don't know. I don't hold it against him. You know, had he been had he been with the Dolphins, I think he this may be you know a week he would have called in after you know them beating us. But oh, yeah. uh, if, twist of fate for him. So uh, I, I I understand why he maybe want to stay out of the media a little bit. So this is the 85th episode. And we're honoring Chad in a way, I guess. You could you could say that he's probably what the the greatest wide receiver in Bengals history. Um, some would argue not, but I I think you could put him up there easily with some of the greats in in uh, club history. But uh, Kurt, if there's one Ocho Cinco memory that really sticks with you, what is it? Oh man, <laughs> there's there's quite there's quite a bunch. Um, you know, I have the, I have this memory. Well, you know, I'll I'll have to go back to his his just love of the game. I mean, there's ever you know, if you're not a Bengals fan, like you're always knocking on Chad. You're like, oh, he's he's doing it for the attention, or he's doing it because he wants people to notice him, or this and that. I look at a guy that just loved what he did. I mean, he's a professional football player, and that's just got to be a really fun job to have. I mean, you get to play football you know, your favorite sport for your job every day. And he was just looking for every way to make it as fun as he could. So, yeah, change your last name to Ocho Cinco. What the heck? Or wear a sombrero <laughs> or do a dance in the end zone. I don't think he ever did it to be cocky. I just think he did it because he's just a fun-loving guy and he just loves to play. So I think that's that's the greatest thing that I can always remember about Chad is that he just he's, he just loves to play football and he loves to have a good time. And I always liked watching him play. You can't argue that. He definitely had fun on the field, Kurt. That, that is a very good point. Mickey, what about, about you? Is there anything specific or, or anything about Ocho Cinco, or I'm sorry, Chad Johnson, that uh, you specifically remember? Um, I mean, I've said it before. I'm a huge Chad fan, and I know people grew tired of his annex, and he became, because he was, a, you know, the, the face of the Bengals, he became a scapegoat when the Bengals weren't losing. And, I, you know, I had nothing but respect for that guy. But if I had to go back and pick, like, say, one play that I remember – of Chad Johnson that just like epitomized like the way I felt about Chad, you know, I would have to go back to, I think it was 2003 in Baltimore, um, was it in Baltimore or no, it was in Cincinnati and the Bengals were on like their own I don't know, 20 yard line, 15 yard line, something like that. And, uh, um, Kitna threw uh, a pass to 
to Chad Johnson that was tipped by, man, maybe Ed Reed that looked like a sure pick, but it was just tipped. And Johnson ended up, you know, getting behind Reed, you know, saw pretty much saw the play developing and then, and then took it, took it to the house. So, I mean, it was just huge. Uh, it was a backbreaker for the Ravens. And uh, I just remember that as like almost like a coming out party because I mean, that was, that was before, you know, before Palmer. So Chad was still solid, but I mean, that was just awesome. So that would probably be my moment. There are so many good ones, honestly, when you think about it. And I mean, I, for me, what I always go back to are the the touchdown celebrations and some of the scripted ones. And I, I enjoyed when he used the, the pylon as a putter. I thought that was cool. Uh, one that I really remember is what up in the Soldier Field when he did the, the river dance. That was, that was a pretty good one, too. Um, who knew he was such a good dancer? He parlayed that into a nice little <laughs> career on Dancing with the Stars, you know, but... Uh, uh, when he had the, the, the Hall of Fame jersey or the jacket that he put on on the sidelines with the cheerleader. And then he all, hey, who could forget the, the proposal to the cheerleader? I mean, you know, the guy, like Kurt said, he, he just had a lot of fun playing the game. And, you know, I, it's a shame that things, I, I wouldn't say they've ended because you never know, but it's a shame what he's going through right now. And I, I think for, for the amount of time and effort he put in here in Cincinnati to, to come up short in the Super Bowl was unfortunate this past year with the Patriots. And I don't know. I, I was, I'm a fan. We dogged him a lot here on the podcast when, when things weren't going well. But, uh, you, know, he, he, you know, he was uh, a fan favorite for a long time. But we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on Chad Johnson. So uh, if you want to give us a call, we're going to be doing the show here for another 25 minutes or so. We'd love to hear your thoughts on Chad Johnson or Chad Ochocinco. Give us a call at 404-HOO-DAY-7. You can also leave us a voicemail there as well, and we'll play it uh, next week during the show. Or, hey, if you want, you can send us your, your favorite memories there in the chat room as well. Mention the chat room. We record the show live each and every Wednesday at 9 o'clock Eastern time. We'd love for you to join us and, and check us out on video as well. And uh, you can always – Check out our podcasts uh, at whodayfans.com. And we also now have a, uh, a, a Who, Day, uh, Who Day Weekly YouTube page as well. Check it out at youtube.spntv. I know there's a lot of links thrown at you, but we'll make sure we include it in the show notes, which, by the way, is that link, whodayfans.com slash 85. I think I'm done. I think I'm done. But so, yeah, if you want to give us a call, 404 Who Day 7, we've got about another 25 minutes. We'd love to hear from you. With that said, let's move ahead to this week. Bengals hosting the Steelers at Paul Brown Stadium on Sunday night football in front of a national audience. Now, the last time they played in front of a national audience, it didn't go so well. Um, with the way the last two weeks have gone, Mickey, we'll start with you. What are you expecting on Sunday night? Well, let's take a step. Let's, let's take an interim step. And, um, you know, something that I, I made a note of on Sunday that I wanted to talk about today. And, um, I, you know, I'm getting a lot. I'm getting a lot of. Um, of grief on Twitter um, because during the game I'm not one of those fans that that just flip out at everything and and so like you know you know I I, I get frustrated and you know I, I curse and I do whatever when, when you know Dalton throws a pick six but never in my head do I do I honestly think like man we got to we should have got a better quarterback or, or you know Palmer would be better in this position and and i see people and i'm hoping some of these people listen i see people tweet that and then i respond like man chill look at what you're saying and they just rip into me and man i, I just gotta say man, it, it makes twittering during the games um just not fun you know what i mean like i i i, do, I hate reading that and i get it i mean it gives you a voice but man what, what, when you say something, make it make sense. Like I just, I don't know. I just wanted to, I just wanted to get that off my chest and, <laughs> and man, stop turning on other Bengals fans when, when they disagree. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I fully expected the Bengals to win that game on Sunday, just like most Bengals fans. But you know, when, when, when the Browns were coming back, I think we were still up seven, maybe, I don't know. Um, people were flipping out saying ball game. And I'm like, we're still winning the game on the road in the NFL. Like you are, this is ridiculous. So I don't know. I just want to say everyone just needs to chill, take a step back. I'm Switching gears. I'm probably guilty of that as well, though, Mick. I'm uh, in the moment, in the heat of it. You, you say some tweets. You send some tweets that maybe you regret. Now, I would never go and say that I'd rather have Carson Palmer back, like some people have said to you. But you know, I, I, I certainly understand. In the heat of the moment, you, you are upset. I get it, but it, I just wish I, I like I like reading like the the more thought out comments. And I saw some good ones. Um, 
But yeah, there was a lot of bad ones. But switching gears though, um, you know, it stinks losing to those two teams. Um, and you know, back to Twitter, I saw a lot of people talking about how our season was over, which just cracks me up. Um, the season's not over, and and as a matter of fact, you know, if the season ended today, we'd be in eighth place in the AFC, which is not where we want to be. But right. if we, you know, if we beat a Steelers team, like I said last week, that is probably one of the simplest. Um, you know, Steelers teams that we faced in the past six years. I mean, look at the injuries they've got. Look at look at how they've been playing. You know, they're not dominating. They're not as scary. Um, you know, I think I really think that um, the the Ravens fa- the the Ravens team is a stronger team than the Steelers this year. So I mean, if we can take care of business at home against the Steelers, all of a sudden we're back on the winning record. We're probably in the top six, you know, in the AFC, and it makes these last two losses you know, they'll matter maybe at the end of the season, you know, if it becomes a dog fight, but they make them not hurt so bad. So, you know, I expect to see something from the Bengals. I think, you know, it's already sold out. I think yep. the fans are going to be pretty pumped. I, I think that, you know, you know, everything's there for the Bengals to have a good game. I hope we throw the book at the Steelers. And I hope, you know, last week was the kind of game where we were looking ahead because I want to see the Bengals team that we saw at the beginning of the season play the Steelers because I think we have a, a pretty good shot to beat them. Yeah, this is probably the best shot we've had in years uh, to, to beat the Steelers. They've got a lot of guys out, a lot of guys coming back from injury. Kurt, before we get to your analysis on the Steelers game, let's go to the Bengals hotline. Uh, we got a new, we got a caller on the line. Who's this? Hey, this is uh, John, and I live in Richmond, Kentucky. I called you guys about a month ago. I think Absolutely. Was, What's happening, uh, John? Yeah, it was like a week after the Ravens game or whatever. Yeah, well, to, uh, to get uh, to the point uh, – yeah, the, the injuries we've had, you know, losing Bernard Scott and the players on the front line, you know, the, the Bengals, they're not the Packers or the Steelers. So to have those kinds of losses just really, really devastates a team, you know, like the Bengals. However, uh, I think we got an excellent opportunity to beat Pittsburgh this weekend. I've got tickets to the game. I can't wait to be there. And I'm really excited that's, that it's going to be at night and it's in prime time. And I think the Bengals will win. I really do. I, I've got them winning by 10 points. That's awesome, John. So you're going to the game. You're making the trip from Richmond, huh? That's correct. Very cool. Uh, we Just a couple minutes ago, we'll let you chime in on this. Just a couple minutes ago, we were talking about Chad Johnson. Do you have a specific memory of Chad Johnson that, uh, that, you, that you're fond of? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Who could forget Chad Johnson? Uh well, I remember uh, it's been a few years ago uh, when they the Cincinnati Bengals played the Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore, and Ray Lewis, I thought he killed Chad Johnson for That's one right. second. He knocked his helmet off. Oh, yeah. And I remember Chad getting up and walking over to him and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> that's one particular memory. Chad Johnson's tough. To take a shot like that and be on his feet was incredible. That was a huge play on that drive, I remember, because they were down – it was the last drive of the game, basically, and that prolonged, I believe that was either a third or fourth down. It gave the Bengals a first down, and they went down the field, and uh, I believe Andre Caldwell scored the game-winning touchdown for the Bengals. Uh, I think that was 9 That's right. That was the first year we had uh, Cedric Benson, if, if I remember correctly. And I was going to say also, you know, we, we, you never know what's going to be a good trade and what isn't. I understand Cedric Benson fumbled a lot last year, but now – Looking at the situation the team's in, oh, my God, we should never <laughs> let Benson go. We could choose him desperately right now. You know, John, that's an excellent point. We had a lot of people on Twitter uh, tweeting the same thing about missing said. And, uh, you know, who knows? Again, and, and we bring up the offensive line. you got three new guys in the middle. I understand that, uh, you know, the professionals and, and whatnot, but uh, you're right. Uh, Cedric Benson with his fumbles, and, and who knows if this would be a different – scenario where we're at right now because we we've seen what he did in green bay he's he's fumbled a lot already but uh again hey john safe travels to cincinnati on sunday night enjoy the game and and who day my friend thanks a lot for taking my call love your show who day thank you john that's awesome and mickey said it in the chat room that's so great when people call in i love it and then you know just follow up on the chat room another chat i mean another awesome you know, uh, Chad moment Reed mentioned is when he guaranteed the win over the undefeated Chiefs. I mean, that was awesome. And then, and then to follow through. I mean, it's easy to guarantee a win, but then to actually win. <laughs> Do you know the one thing I remember about that game was just um, the Peter Warwick punt return touchdown. 
That was oh, he had two touchdowns. Yeah. He had that long pass where he did the little pirouette in the middle of the field, and then uh, he had the punt return. It was awesome. Speaking of Reed, he did go to the game on Sunday. Uh, he blames the loss on himself because he missed the first 10 minutes of the game because he lost his ticket. Smooth. I know, right? Uh, he did mention earlier, I don't know if you guys happen to catch this or not, and again, we try to do our best here to, to paint the show in a, in a positive light, but uh, he says Terrence Newman looks just as bad in person. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have any comments on that. I'm just, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think Mickey said it earlier. I mean, he's a guy that we picked up that we expected to do more, and I can't say that he's been a 100% complete disappointment, but, I mean, he's been 50-50. He's had some questionable calls, you know, earlier, and, um, you know, it's just tough, you know. Um, I mean, looking at the cornerback situation, though, I mean, I, I have been reading a little bit about the fact that uh, that Drake Kirkpatrick looks like he's getting ready to start. Yes. Um, it looks like they. It's possible that he might come back in the Steelers game, but Marvin is also tweaking with the idea of you know not playing him for the Steelers game and then getting the bye. So that essentially, he has two more free weeks to kind of get ready for the Manning brothers to come to town. So um, I'm looking as Terrence Newman is kind of like a temporary kind of fill in at the moment. But I think once Dre gets up and hopefully he performs the way we're all expecting him to that uh, Terrence is going to give up that starting spot to Kirkpatrick. That's a great point, and you're right. Marvin's been kind of hinting at it all week. Uh, I don't know how much playing time he'll get this weekend uh, for the Steelers, and, you know, they've got uh, some great speed on the outside and their, their receivers and Mike Wallace, and, you know, the, yeah. and again, we, we come to another team here in the Steelers who have great tight ends, and it seems like we always kind of struggle with – you know, defending the tight ends, Mickey. It's a theme, man. And, and, you know, we talked about it last week. But uh, it, we, we got – I mean, I think that's that just shows the weakness of our linebackers. Um, and we kind of are soft. Yeah, it just hurts. It just hurts to see, you know, a team getting beat by the same things. You know, you would hope that you, you'd, you'd watch film and – because the other team obviously is. They they know the weakness. But – uh um. I, I I don't know. I I'm so frustrated by the not guarding the tight ends that it just I have no more words. It makes me so angry. Kurt, before we uh, we talked to John on the phone, we wanted to send it uh, send it your way for your analysis this week of the Bengals Steelers matchup. Uh, what are you looking forward to? Uh, well, I think just like every other Bengals fans, I'm out there. I'm out there uh, looking for a win. I mean. I think that we've been looking at these last two weeks and we've been looking at games that we should win, you know, games that are like W's in the column. And then I look at this game and instead of like a solid W, I'm thinking like this is a game that we could win, that we should win. Um, and I'm just looking at all the positives. I mean, we're coming back home. It's a sold out game. Now, unfortunately, we're so close to Pittsburgh. A lot of those fans are going to be Pittsburgh fans. But, um, you know, I've already been reading, you know, they're calling it an orange out. They're going to be handing out orange towels. So I think the fan base at Paul Brown Stadium is going to be great. Um, we've got injuries on our side. You know, Troy Palomalo is out. Um, one of their starting tackles is out. And then their, you know, their number one and number two running back are both injured and have been limited all week. So you got to wonder how effective their running game is going to be. And then, you know, you look at things that you're going to worry about. I mean, Ben Roethlisberger, as much as I completely hate the guy and despise him from what he did to us at BG and now in Cincinnati, I mean, he can tear apart a secondary. And our secondary has been nothing but weak. And so you got to worry about that. I think um, it's a big positive, the fact that there are seven teams in the AFC that are three and three. We're one of them. Um, Pittsburgh is down, I guess, number 10 in the AFC right now. We're number eight. You know, we're still not even halfway through the season yet. So, I mean, it's a far way to look. But I think that the, the greatest thing that I can say as a Bengals fan and to all the other Bengals fans is that this season is not over. I mean, we are at 500 right now. We're coming up on a winnable game against a division rival at home on Sunday night. And if we win going into the bye at 4-3, and three, I think that we got a really good outlook on the rest of the season. I think we can give a lot of teams that maybe we thought that were going to be hard games that we might be able to give a run for the money later. So I think that this game is a huge catalyst that's just going to propel us forward through the rest of the season, and I'm, I'm looking at good things. 
if I'm not mistaken, and I, again, I haven't had a chance to, to take a look at the Steelers' schedule, but I believe they have not won a game on the road yet this year. Um, I, I don't think, you know, they, they've had a hard time. I think they, they went out to Oakland, lost there late. Um, they've struggled on the road for some reason, and that's not normally – Pittsburgh's MO. They lost a couple weeks ago on Thursday night football. Now, granted, they've had a couple extra days to prepare now. We have to keep that in mind. They played on Thursday night. Uh, it was basically a week ago. So they've had an extra couple days of preparation, and that's never good, especially for the Steelers. So you got to keep that in mind as well. But I'm looking at this uh, a banged-up Steelers defense. Harrison's not 100%. Pouncey on the offensive line, not 100%. No Palomalu. Uh, it's not – the same Steelers, the, the same vaunted Steelers from years ago. I think you, there are teams now you're starting to see how you can beat them. I think hopefully they, they take note of what Tennessee did uh, last week and they put that into their game plan. I'm hoping we see a lot more Andrew Hawkins. I don't know where he's been the last couple of weeks. Maybe teams have, have figured out how to defend him. Maybe, but I mean, you also can't, you can't, you know, he's getting some looks, but you can't rely on a three yard pass to go 50 some yards every week. And I feel like you know, that was another thing. It just seemed like we were trying to force those plays. Um, you know, you got to get creative with a guy like Hawkins. He's not going to just, you know, become some, some slot receiver that runs the standard routes. Like the Bengals were most successful with him when they get him in space and they get him moving. So we, we got to do more of that. Um, you know, not just the, the, the slant across the middle, you know, three yards down the field, hoping that he can make something happen, you know, hit him with the screen, you know, hand the ball to him, things like that. So I, you know, I agree. We need to see more of them. I just think we need to see the right kind of things from him rather than just, you know, throwing the, 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 the slants. What about you, Kurt? What do you think as far as the, and I don't know, maybe I, a lot of teams didn't know what they had in Andrew Hawkins as far as the Bengals go, how to defend him. I, I've, it's just something that I've noticed over the last couple of weeks. What, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, if you look back into my post back when I went down to training camp uh, over the summer, I mean, you all know that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Baby Hawk. Um, you know, I took some pictures of him and Green lining up together on that training camp day so many times. I'm like, man, you are, you are going to see this a lot, and, and you have. Um, the only problem is, you know, once people start getting tape on you, they start figuring out. And I totally agree, Mickey. I mean, you can't expect to throw him little dump passes on the side and then expect him, you know, to run like a crazy man and cut and cut and cut and have people miss after miss and then go 70 yards. I mean, it'll happen every once in a while, but I think those have just been like people underestimating him. Um, I think just like with A.J. Green, they got to start figuring out ways to get him um, to be more uh, putting him in different places. You know, maybe not just in the slot, but I know he's not a big guy, but line him up on the outside, try to confuse him. Um, and that'll put A.J. Green in the slot or someone else. I mean, you just, just like uh, you were saying earlier, Nick, the Bengals have seemed less creative in, in their offense the last two games where, I mean, you had that wildcat thrown out and fake this and fake that. I'm not asking you to do it every time, but, I mean, you got to get productive. you got to – you have to be creative if you're going to be a winning team in the NFL – in 2012. Agree 100%. We haven't seen the Wildcats since Washington. Sanu is one <laughs> of those guys that uh, Mickey was really high on. And he's never, it seems to, I don't think he's even ever active on Sundays. So now it's to a point, if you do activate him, Mickey, your teams are, not, well, you won't know till Sunday, but still um, teams might be a little more aware of what, what the Bengals might throw out there. I mean, they're going to be aware that he can throw the ball, but there's so many different ways you can run that offense. Um, you know, you, you start off with a guy that, you know, can can sweep, can get to the outside, could potentially still hand off to a, a running back, you know, could, you know, throw a quick out or run a reverse. I mean, there's so many options. I doubt teams are going to, you know, pull their safeties in when we're in a wildcat anymore. I think that they're going to leave a guy back because, you know, you don't you don't ever want an A.J. Green to get behind your your, you know, your defense. But there's so many different ways to run it, and it's something different. Like, it, it, you know, it, it makes them change their defense. Um, you know, what I really liked about that play in Washington is that, that they kept, um, you know, Dalton on the field, and he went out as a receiver because potentially, you know, you have a, you know, a 15-yard gain there instead of a, 
you know, a huge touchdown, you, you go into your hurry up and, and you've got their defense, you got the, you know, potentially a, a really good defensive matchup you want. And, and by going no huddle, you know, you, you got them on, on their toes. And when you look at a team right now like Pittsburgh that is, you know, pretty banged up on defense, that that's the kind of things that can win a game. So, you know, I do hope we see more of that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not an offensive coordinator, but I do know that when, when, when teams game plan and they do the right kinds of things to, te- you know, to the upper echelon teams in the NFL, they can beat them. I mean, Seattle just beat New England. It's happened all season. You know, if you plan right, you can beat any team on any, any given Sunday. And I just wish – the coaches, you know, kind of came with a plan instead of like the, the, the bread and butter kind of, you know, lunch pail team that we think we are. Um, I, I don't think we're quite there, especially with the injuries uh, on our line. Like we talked about earlier. Well, let's wrap things up because we've, I can't believe we've gone 45 minutes. This, this show has flown by. Um, let's do some score predictions. We'll start with you, Kirk. Uh, give us your, your final score prediction for Sunday night football. Oh, man, this is hard. Um, I've been trying to do some predictions, and I, I, I just can't come up with anything. And, and, and uh, every, all my predictions have, been, have, have gone wrong this season except for one. So um, I'm going to stick – I think it's going to be a close game. I'm going to go um, 24-21. Bengals pull it out in a fourth-quarter drive. Andy Dalton wins it right at the end. Very bold. Read in the chat room, Mickey, says 48-10. Bengals over the Steelers, a little bold as well. Uh, what about you? What do you have for a score prediction? Very similar. I'm going to go 24-20. I think that, uh, you know, other than, you know, I just think that it's not going to be some high-scoring affair. I think that the Bengals are still going to try to run the ball. I think the Steelers are going to kind of play the Bengals the way they always do. Um, we just got, I mean, the pick, we got to watch out for the pick six that we've seen every week. We got to get that guy off the field. So, um I know at 24 20, I think that's a solid score. I think, a, you know, you know, a, a field goal when, when it should have been a touchdown for the Steelers is going to be the difference. Daryl in the chat room, who, by the way, won our, our contest tonight. So congrats again to him. He says 17, 14 Bengals with big Ben throwing a pick late at the end. Uh, Cody Chalmers in the chat room, 28, 21 win in the last few minutes. A good, good uh, choice there. I'm going to go for, from a score I'm going to say it's going to be a low-scoring affair. I'll say Bengals 17, Steelers 13. Ooh. So there you have it. Four points. I don't know what the spread is. Um, Neither team coming in uh, really playing well. (laughs) I'm sure NBC wishes this game maybe could have been flexed. (laughs) Just kidding. No, I mean, Steelers Steelers have their audience. So that's there. I think the spread is Steelers two and a half. So the Bengals are dogs, home dogs. Yeah, actually, now it's one and a half. Still, either way, they're home dogs. So, not that we condone gambling in any way here on the podcast, uh, but we're just uh, providing you with the information that's out there. So, be that it is May. We're all predicting Bengals wins. Hopefully, we're here next week during the bye week celebrating a Bengals victory, moving them to to four and three on the season. Kurt, thank you again for, for joining us here uh, down in Asheville. I think Asheville, right? Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, by way of Loveland, Ohio, uh, big who day down there in the south and uh, enjoying the blogs. You're doing a great job writing and I'm um, looking forward to you spending some more time here on the podcast. Yeah, I'd love to come back. Thanks for having me on and uh, who day to you guys. Absolutely. Mickey, as always, we, you know, we sat through that Reds game last week. It was rough, but, uh, you know, we have a chance to turn the page this week in, in Queen City Sports. Yeah, uh, we need to. That That old page is tired. I'm done looking at it. Are you going to be tailgating all day Sunday? I don't know. Um, look at the weather. I'm definitely going to uh, have a beverage outside before the game, so it uh, <laughs> should be a good time. Absolutely. Well, enjoy, your, enjoy the game. Be safe down there and have fun on the bus and stay warm and uh, big who day. Yeah, who day. And that is going to wrap up episode 85 of the podcast here on Who Day Weekly. Don't forget, you can email us at podcast at whodayfans.com and give us a follow on Twitter at who day Weekly. Who Day Weekly is an SPNT production. For more information about our other podcasts, log on to SPNT.tv. For my co-host, Mickey Menser, and our good friend, Kurt, North Carolina, I'm Supes. We'll see you next time on Who Day Weekly. Who Day? Who Day? Who Day? Who day?